Thank you so much. Uh, you kind of stole a little bit of my thunder with the five R's, so I appreciate you covering those. <laughs> so really excited to have uh, this panel of really impressive uh, individuals. And so I'd love to introduce them now. Uh, starting with uh, Dr. Alexander Hay. He was a British Royal Engineer for 25 years, specializing in fortifications and infrastructure development in a variety of roles around the world. He transitioned to industry in 2013 and is the founding principal of Southern Harbor, a Toronto-based risk and resilience advisory that helps clients understand their operational fragilities now and into the future. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto, teaching and researching complex infrastructure system risks, resilience, and protection. This particular focus is on the rehabilitation of communities traumatized by conflict and disasters. We also have a Mr. Craig Applegate. He is the founding principal of Dialogues Toronto Studio and a passionate designer who believes in the power of built form to meaningfully improve the well-being of communities and the environment they are part of. Craig graduated from the Harvard School of Design with a master's of architecture and urban design. He has since led innovation design projects addressing complex challenges facing our communities, as well as on his advocacy of sustainable building design and urban climate change resilience. And then last but not least, we have Major General Vincent Colonnese. Major General Colonnese is a retired United States Marine with extensive global experience across logistics and supply chain, global security operations and infrastructure management. His 36 year career was marked by orchestrating successful large scale transformations in organizations with as many as 33,000 personnel. He last served as the commanding general of Marine Corps installations overseeing 24 installations in the US and Pacific regions. The billet focused on what the Marine Corps calls installation next, which includes installation resiliency, digital fortress, reliable smart grids, and renewable energy using smart city technology. He spent the last year of command developing a recovery plan for the East Coast Marine Corps bases severely impacted by Hurricane Florence. And he is the founder of Hammer 9 Solutions LLC and currently serves on the advisory board for the 11th hour service based in the DC area. So just as uh, was described, the five bars of resilience, again, robustness, redundancy, resourcefulness, response and recovery. Those are the things we'd like to cover today, talking about how we create the, the new bases uh, and resilient communities they are part of. So I uh, wanted to really just dive in uh, with you, Major General, and really understand, you know, with your leading of these 24 bases across the world, how did you uh, to create a directive and expectation for your commanders to develop resilience for the bases that they commanded? Hey, Dustin, uh, thank you for the introduction. And AFWorks, thank you for the invite. I think this is a, a really admire how the Air Force gets after problems and bringing all these uh, smart people together, uh, not including me, is a, is a great way to get after it. So I think you always have to begin at why on resiliency. You know, what's the in order to? Um, and for installations, particularly Marine Corps installations, it's about combat power. And it's, it's about generating combat power. And if you keep that in mind, everything else uh, kind of falls into place. And that gives you the why. So that resiliency to generate combat power. And I believe, you know, when I was in the seat as, as the installation commander, both on the West Coast and then when I had the, the, the whole shooting match, the Marine Corps needs to be ready when the, least, when the nation's least ready. So whether we're hit by a hurricane, fires in California, cyber attack, asymmetric attack, man-made attack or just man-made mistakes, we need to be able to bounce back and continue to generate that combat power within that installation. So we've got to be ready to go. Uh, throughout the OD and including the Marine Corps, we're right now fighting from our installations. We're targeting bad guys, flying Group 5 UAS. Reach back is, is more than just a buzzword now. We're doing that wherever our forces are forward deployed, whether on sea, uh, forward, bobs or wherever they are. They're dependent on that connectivity and that capability. So when you look at the light of the, the installation that it's even more important that that installation is, is operating and we'll get back operating as quickly as possible. 
obviously we deploy combat forces and you think about the simulators and the importance of that. Uh, and then lastly, you think there's an expectation, not there is an expectation that the DOD, these large installations, large capabilities in times of defense of civilian authorities, when nation needs it, both the local community, the state or national command authority, that DOD can respond and help the nation in, at the homeland itself. And you can't do that if, if you're part of the problem. So that's kind of the essence of resiliency and the, and, the, and the scope that we looked at resiliency at the installation. And then with that scope, you can, you can get to, you know, you know the why, you can get to the solution if you know the why. And, I, and I'll stop there. Right, that's great. Major General, appreciate that side from the context of, you know, actually operations on the base and, and that experience. I mean, and the, the challenge is obviously understanding all those risks and, and how to prioritize and what areas because they come from all different angles. Um, uh, Alec, uh, from your perspective and working with the clients you do around the world and how you're analyzing things, you know, what processes or what tools do we have to evaluate risk profiles from that perspective? Well, we have a surprising number of tools, uh, Justin. Um, really, picking up from um, uh, what the general was saying, you know, one of the, the, the key issues here is to actually know what you're trying to achieve. And if you invest time in understanding the situation, understanding your own operation, uh, you can then identify the issues you have and select the right tools for the task. Uh, a lot of organizations use uh, either a standardized model, a template, or they uh, will pick a tool that they're familiar with to define what the issues are. And all that does is reinforce prejudice, um, and you'll miss whole risks. What we need to understand is what the situation is, what all of our operating functions depend upon, and what they in turn depend upon so we can identify how we are fragile. What resources do we need where, for what functions, to continue our operations, to continue moving, to have that assurance continuity? And by building out our understanding of our existing operations, we can select the right tools. But there's an abundance. Uh, everything from uh, standoff, satellite standoff recognition to build a tableau of what physically exists for the situation, through to dependency mapping and causal chain analysis, through to influence mapping, stakeholder engagement, and things like that. All of these things come together uh, but we need to build that common reference so that we understand what is required and it will be unique to each base. Um, you can't use a template to do that. Right. Definitely understanding the, the operational purpose for those bases and, and what really is the true uh, essence of the mission from their aspect, correct? Yes, everything falls out of that. Uh, it, it will be fundamentally different. Uh, for each base because it's a different location, even if the mission is the same. The personnel will be different, the relationship with the local community will be different, the uh, natural hazards, uh, physical hazards will be different as well. Right, right. We're kind of take, taking a look at that. Uh, Craig, I'd like to come to you and really understand you know, from the big picture, taking up where Dr. Hay left off, uh, the big picture of resilience planning. You know, what are some of the big future stresses? I mean, we did see an incredible, uh, unpredicted uh, Category 5 for Tyndall Air Force Base. What are you seeing we're going to see in the future for these different installations? Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest challenges that uh, forces face is uh, future climate change that's now escalating. I, I think you're going to see um, two key challenges. One is the increasing frequency and the increasing um, intensity of storm events. So you're going to have to plan for resilience in the face of those. And, and those are gonna be increasing as the average atmospheric air temperature increases. The other thing I think that's gonna come along with um, uh, global warming 
is uh, a rise in sea level. So a number of key bases are along the uh, Gulf Coast, uh, somewhere on the Pacific Ocean and Atlantic. And so you're gonna be looking at the potential for increase in storm surge uh, penetration of bases. And as time goes on, actual uh, sea level rise on those bases. So you're going to have to plan both shorter term for the storm events and then longer term for the, the rise in uh, ocean levels. Right, right. And as Colonel Flynn said, you know, these bases are in vulnerable areas, but for the specific purpose and mission of those bases, that they have so we do have to continue to find ways to develop either or new new systems new uh, construction or new uh, variety of situations to continue to be able to operate those bases where they are um you know picking up from there you know with someone has the the experience of rebuilding and kind of a little ahead of of the Tyndall rebuild major general um if you could, you know, when it came to planning for the rebuild of Camp Lejeune, um, you know, how did you work through, you know, managing the balance of resilience and needs and cost and in implementing the innovation into that base? You know, what were some of the lessons learned that you had from that area? So, uh, I mean, it's obviously ongoing and, uh, and we talk about installations. Uh, the military is very short cited in, in my view you know we wear the uniform we go to command two three years um even whether a commandant or service chief is four years but the installations five years is a chip and a putt ten years you know military construction everything else you really have to have the long view as, as you uh go to solve these these problems and not the short view um prior to the storm we had put out guidance about being able to operate off the grid 14 days and getting back to every base is different, whether it's, you, you have uh, geothermal, solar, uh, Miramar has got uh, methane from waste dumps. Um, uh, each base is different, but you need to be able to wield power. It's probably the most, get that power back operating. So microgrids and another source of power often time, most of our bases are, are reliant on, on shore power, civilian power, if you will. So we were already kind of moving towards that, but this kind of this storm escalated, especially in Camp Lejeune. Uh, uh, this Hurricane Florence set a record for, for rain. It wasn't so much the winds, it was, it was a constant rain that just parked itself over North Carolina and didn't move. And just kind of the scope, our marine bases are all on water. We're amphibious and it makes sense, but there's vulnerabilities being on, being on that water. So the scope of the problem, you gotta begin with the problem. That's over 187,000 acres in the North Carolina of, of, of cluster of bases. There's 47,000 Marines, 65,000 family members, 6,100 homes. Um, and the bill was $3.7 billion of damage. Yeah. So I say pay now or pay later. So it's a long game, right? You, these, these, most of nobody's fault. These bases just built during World War II and most of the structures we use as Marines are same structure, we put lipstick on it, make it a little better, but it doesn't have the bones nor the engineering to sustain this kind of storm. 800 buildings damaged, 500 beyond repair. So just kind of, you know, it's headquarters building, training facilities, air, uh, aircraft hangars, trestle bridges. The, to deploy the force for the Marine Corps, we have to get to the port. And we actually own the railhead. That Those trestles were washed out, pretty, pretty important impact to our ability to generate that combat power. So you really got to generate. So in it, you have to look at the infrastructure. You have to look at the resiliency and you can't do the, the cheap way is not the, is, is not the best way. You usually you have to have, whether it's the fiber optics that come in from one building and then has to have redundancy. If that building goes out, how are you going to, you know, replicate that? You're, I, I talked about the energy grid itself and the network. And it's people processing things. And I'll give you a couple of things and get off and get off the, uh, the net here. But when we, DLA delivers fuel on our bases, when they evacuated the personnel, there was no personnel to drive those trucks. Marines then drove those trucks. Um, commissary is operated not by the you know, by the, you know, the commissary within DOD. Um, when that was damaged, they had to repair them. There was things outside our controls, but. Getting back to Alex's point, you have to understand the processes and things 
and then be able to respond and have those mitigating either mitigating things in place or contingency planning. We pre-positioned high power crews on base and we were able to get our power up before anybody else and then actually be able to help the community, mutual aid, immediate aid, our fire department and our medical uh, capabilities. We had a good plan. We have a plan for the base of the future. This accelerated it. Our biggest fight, I think, and continue is, is with Congress and others, is to justify the resiliency that they put in because it's not sexy. Put, <laughs> put in that, that sexy infrastructure. That transport system of the network is, needs to be robust and needs right. to have the redundancy. So that's kind of the fight they're doing. We got the money, they're doing a great job, but right. this will be a five, six year uh, project. Right, right. Well, yeah, and, and talking about the robustness, I mean, obviously that's a big part of it. And uh, one one uh, strategy would be is just to make everything a fortress uh, completely uh, there. But um, Craig, if I could go back to you from the architectural perspective, you know, do we do just do that? Do we harden just all areas of the base or do we take a uh, combination of different perspectives on that? Yeah, that's a good question, Dustin. And uh, the three of us were discussing this before the event. I think what you want to aim for is operational continuity. You want to be able to get that base going as soon as you can, as soon as the storm passes. So what you need to harden are the things that you're going to need to do that. So you're going to have to harden the command center. It should be able to withstand any kind of storm event um, other than a, a freighter crashing into it. Um, you're going to have to uh, make sure there's water supply. You're going to have to make sure their generators are ready to go immediately. Gas generators are get it started and then diesel from there. Uh, waste lines, uh, all the, the key IT that you're going to need. Um, the rest of it, basically, you should see as being able to be disposable. Um, and, and there are various ways to do that, uh, but you, you just cannot protect the whole base. So I think go for the things that you absolutely need for that operational continuity, and then you see the rest of it as uh, um, a non-essential. Right, right. I appreciate that too. And, and that's a great perspective on that area. Um, I do want to, to make sure that we do focus on this because Major General, you brought it up as well, and it's the people and, and how they operate on the base. And, and during a crisis situation, that's what continues that operation. So. Alec, you know, based on your, uh, your background on how to build resilient communities and how to make sure, I mean, what's one of the big things is, is getting, uh, improving the quality of life on base and keeping people closer to the base. You know, how do we do that when we're looking at the base of the future to create a more resilient community? Well, I think one of the, um, one of the key issues that we need to look at is not fit people to the infrastructure, but say what we, how we wish people to live and what assurances, operational assurances we need, and then select the infrastructure, design the infrastructure to enable that. And uh, when you look at the installations that have proved to be fragile, you can see that a community has been imposed upon infrastructure as opposed to the infrastructure being developed to enable that community to be resilient. Uh, operational resilience of infrastructure and services enables a community to be resilient, but it doesn't mean the community will be resilient. The community needs to have confidence in its leadership. Uh, ironically enough, that can be in the absence of actual leadership, but it needs to have that confidence in its leadership. There needs to be a balance and a strategic framework between the base community and the wider community, because a lot of the families don't live on base. And there needs to be an alignment between the, uh, the interests of those families, the local community, and the interests of the base. Uh, if there is a misalignment, you know, the base could have a restoration of power and everybody around the base has nothing. It exacerbates the differences and uh, assistance doesn't follow. There's, um, if you're going to have a mutual uh, assistance agreement or something similar to that, there needs to be a sense of we're in this together. It's a shared burden, but there's also a shared benefit. And it doesn't matter if the base is, you know, in 
uh, in the homeland or if it's uh, an expeditionary base somewhere else. That relationship with the local community is fundamental. So uh, in some cases, you have bases that have um, taken on uh, responsibility in a crisis for some of the municipal functions. And you see this particularly in some northern communities where the, um, the facility, uh, in this case, a military uh, base, will look after the, um, uh, the, the housing divisions that are adjacent to the base, ensure that they've got the power, water, and so on and so forth, because that part of it helps the municipality reduce their overall burden, they can then assign the resources that are needed for recovery, which in turn helps the base because the base needs to reach out to bring in resources. It needs to have its supply lines uh, reopened. So there's a, there's a mutual benefit in this. And, um, and I think quite often it is easy to lose uh, sight of these events affecting more than just your own interests, your own operation. You, you, while you have to be capable of functioning in an emergency, you are that last line of support. Um, you're also part of the bigger whole that needs to recover. And your right, role right. within that enables the community to do what it needs to do. Certainly, certainly. And based on the locations of many of these installations, I mean, the, the community is just another extension of the actual installation. Uh, yeah. Major General, what could you uh, uh, add to that? Yeah, I mean, so without a doubt, you know, we and these base commanders have, first of all, massive or great responsibility. They really have a lot of authorities, you know, both in crisis and, and during day to day. And every one of them, whether it was when during my command or after or before, it had nothing to do with it. Uh, they took this relationship seriously. They're, they're on all kinds of either governor boards, councils, uh, our emergency operations centers work directly with the emergency operations centers in the local area. They know each other by first name. They're re actually gotten really good at, at doing this and, and, and perform. So that's that mutual aid, the immediate aid. But in, in our communities, whether it's in California or in, uh, in, in the Lejeune area, there's an, you know, the military has a lot of assets and capabilities. And there's an expectation, whether it's fighting Cal, for CAL FIRES, we have a uh, MOU, there's an expectation when they call and they, they reach their ultimate you know, point where they can't do no more or they need our capability, that we're gonna respond. It gets back to the reason why we need to be on uh, up and running. During the hurricane, we, there was high water rescues. Uh, people, people who didn't have hotel rooms came on base. We put them up in barracks. We have all contingencies for that pets, animals, all kinds of things. Our commissary, our food was up before anybody else out in town was. Our fuel stations were up, so they came in, got fuel. We refueled the uh, cell, cell towers, which most cell towers have a backup generator. People couldn't get that. We did that for the community. So we are the community. We're part of the community. Like you said, two thirds live on base, uh, one third lives on base. So that relationship during peacetime before the crisis, through the exercises and training and all this other um, the things that these base commanders do are extremely important because then it gets into the personalities and relationships of trust and what do you need, where do you need it and do it because they're making those decisions at the installation side. They have the authorities for life uh, and rescue and stuff like that without asking permission and they're sending assets and stuff like that. And so when we have vehicles that can swim in the water like our Amtraks or, or a light armored vehicles uh, and they can go save people, uh, they're going to do that. And, uh, and, and rightfully so. And they're saving their own community, right? They're, they're, the, they're the coaches, they're the school teachers, they're the people out there. Um, and I would say and another thing you talked, and I probably didn't answer it, but in the planning side, when you're looking at the base of the future and we're looking at where you're going to put buildings and, and getting back to uh, changes in, in tides and weather and everything else, there's a lot of tools with the geospatial tools you lay it out, you look at the land, you do cat category five, you look at where the water is, you look at the creeks and you, and you do all the planning so you don't build in the wrong locations. And if you do, you mitigate, you might go in a few miles, you might move it away from the creek. You look at all those things and holistically uh, and, and plan so you have that resiliency, the capability to maintain a fight and get back in the fight uh, is important. But I go back to our bases are about generating combat power. And, right. uh, and that's what, 
is expected from this nation. So, right, right. That's great too. And another point that came up in our earlier discussion, I do want to hit on, and maybe Dr. Hay, you want to uh, address this though. I mean, we have COVID nineteen. We're completely, you know, most of us are isolated, working from our offices. We're, com you know, our communities are definitely isolated more. But we talked about the importance of community on the base and building a base that is uh, cohesive and uh, supports that community, um, that, that whole nucleus there. You know, could you touch on how the importance of that and how that should be considered in that part of base resiliency and community resiliency? Certainly. Uh, well, one of the, uh, the key things that we need to, uh, to build in preparation for any uh, crisis is is social capital. It's that ability for a community to function as a community, and that means that it has a trusted communication lines, and typically that is uh, something already inherent within a military um, structure. Not necessarily always reflected in the families, and what we need to be able to do is create that awareness among the families as well as the military personnel of others in the community in their situation. Because quite often the military personnel will be detailed a way to do some task and the families will be collectively taking care of the day to day while um, their partners are away. And that understanding of how everybody and everybody's situation and everyone's um, uh, condition uh, is important. So that community awareness, that focal point where people interact, not in a retail car park lot, but a um, but actually interact at a human basis. So they're aware of each other and they communicate with each other at a, at a personal level. And if we look at how a lot of the bases are laid out or have been laid out in the past and the, the, the way that they are starting to be laid out now, you can see more of this um, community awareness, more of this social capital being enabled by the way the infrastructure is laid out. The infrastructure is no longer considered a series of assets. It's now considered like a system that enables the community to form. It enables social capital. It enables the operation to be effective. That's great. And that's really important. I mean, we don't, we can't continue to operate just uh isolated in things, the community is so important. I mean, the last thing I'd like to hit on though is the recovery and repair side of things. And uh, Craig, do you have any anything you'd like to add on on some great strategies for the quick? Yeah, you know, um, uh, I, I think one of the smartest things that um, forces could think about doing is creating um, uh, modular prefab uh, building units that they would have off site in some safe place that they could reassemble the key base components uh, after um, a storm event. Um, and given that they could be moved to any, any base and assembled quite quickly, it would be a very fast recovery opportunity. The other thing too is um, down the road, um, if storm surges and sea level rise or continue to be an issue for that particular base, then you could relocate those units as well. So I, I think sort of a plug and play um, a strategy might be worth considering and given you could put uh, solar photovoltaics on top of them, you could probably power them as well. So I think there's the technology and um, the opportunity right now to be very effective in doing this. Right, yeah, the, the technology for modular systems to roll in quickly and set up uh, really provides a, a very awesome ability to, to repair and get back up to essential operations quickly. Um, Major General, anything to add from that perspective on, on how to get back in? in no, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's that preparation, whether it's pre-staging personnel capabilities outside the, the danger zone, zone, if you will, but the prefab buildings. Uh, we, we spent a lot of money trying to move trailers, getting them at a very expensive rate. Um, took a long time to hook up and having that capability at hand is smart. You know, another thing I just, I, I feel compelled to say, and I, and I missed it, and I should have said it, it, was social media. Probably one of the most important things. That was the means to communicate during, during the crisis. And that was both with the community and, and the families. And everybody went to that. And if you, and I, I know we're 
it's really, really important both prior, during, and after to use that social media, to have that trusted audience and be able to deliver the information because there's so much misinformation. Right. No, that's, that's very important. And I mean, it's pretty impressive the way the different groups, uh, CE groups, uh, different ones are utilizing social media to communicate and stay in contact. And again, that creates that community uh, as well. So I'm not sure if we're able to take, are, are, we, are the lines open for questions? Brian, I'm not sure if that's open. Okay. Hey, Dustin, and, and, you know, just another thing, it's, it's, if we're waiting for questions, the importance of our installations all vary where they're at. But Cherry Point, for example, is the air traffic control for basically North Carolina, the whole area. So that, that getting that back up, it not only affected the base, but affected the whole F FAA for that whole region. And that was critically important. So, um, and a lot of our installations have, you know, certain or, or for deployment or ports or other things like that. So there's second and third order effects of the installations that sometimes even beyond the, you would consider just the military need. Right, right. I remember I was in uh, Newburgh, North Carolina, taking off on a commercial uh, flight and they, uh, a terrible storm came in when I was on the plane and took out all the power and uh, Cherry Point uh, control tower was able to uh, dispatch us and, and get us out. So it's pretty impressive how everything is uh, well connected there. Um, uh, Dr. Hay, anything you'd like to, to add for some final thoughts on that? Well, it, it's uh, it's fine, really. I mean, I, I was wondering how how to encapsulate all of this, and I think uh, one of the nicest ways to, to to summarize everything that's been said is that as we go through the base planning, we're really aiming for um, a systems approach that is safe to fail. So the operation is unimpeded by the failure of components of that operation. Our capability as a base is unimpeded by the loss of grid power, is unimpeded by a storm surge, is unimpeded by whatever it is, that we are safe to fail. And this is a departure from most of our building codes and standards and all the template solutions that are centered on being fail safe so that they don't result in injury. Uh, but safe to fail would be a, a, a sort of slight change in, in thinking, but uh, really sort of encapsulates what, what's been said. I think. Right. And again, going back to the five R's and closing on that, I mean, it's, it's part of having those redundancies and the, Items where, yeah, exactly, things can fail, but there are plans and strategies to maintain and address those unknown and unknowns that uh, many of our military installations constantly have to work around and deal with. So mm -hmm. um, now, this is really great. We're, uh, I think there's some really great ideas that are coming from the AFWORKS Challenge to help with this resilience. Uh, I'm excited for everyone to continue to dig into the workshop, but thank you all for your time and, uh, I hope everyone continues to have a great uh, afternoon. Thanks, Dustin. Thank you very much. Take care.